Hi everybody, my name is Animateball. I've loved animation my whole life. Everything from traditional 2D animation, to 3D animation, to stop motion, to anime. And I'm currently studying to be a 3D animator myself. So while I'm studying the art of animation, I thought it'd be beneficial to practice thinking critically about the animations I watch. Now, some of you might be thinking, this guy's voice sounds familiar. Well, you may recall me talking about a uh, certain selection of Spongebob episodes a few years back. New Spongebob, in case you haven't noticed by now, your utter obliviousness is not funny! Yeah, that was me. <laughs> Good times, huh? But seriously, I didn't start up this channel just to run my mouth like a channel awesome wannabe. I actually want to be more thoughtful and more constructive about my reviews this time around. I'm not going to pretend like I know everything about animation, its production, or storytelling. Instead, I'm hoping to learn more about it from both the animations I watch, and from other folks in the community. I'd also like to extend a long overdue apology to Aaron Springer and the rest of the folks I viciously insulted back then, and to the late Ernest Borgnine for dedicating those awful videos to him. So, as this new channel's debut video, I'm giving my old Top 20 Worst Spongebob episodes a critical re-evaluation. First in line, we have one of the first episodes of Season 5, Waiting. The premise is that Spongebob sends in a mail order for a free prize and has to wait for it to arrive. Simple, sure, but simple premises can yield entertaining stories when handled well. Unfortunately, that isn't the case here. It starts off okay, but quickly falls apart once the conflict comes into play. What's wrong, Spongebob? If I leave, the mailman might come and I might miss him! Already, this doesn't make sense. I don't mean that in the why-do-they-need-a-fire-department-underwater kind of way. I mean it from a storytelling standpoint. The mailman had already come to Spongebob's house a couple minutes before. Why does he think the mailman would come back on the same day? Even in a premise centered around waiting for mail, there is still plenty of room for wacky shenanigans and character interactions. But all that potential is dispelled by Spongebob refusing to interact with anyone. Hey Spongebob! Wanna do some karate? Not now, I'm busy! This is akin to watching an improv sketch where one actor keeps making offers, while the other actor keeps blocking them. All you end up getting is a humorless scene that goes nowhere. Plus, why won't he just play with his friends to pass the time? It's not like he's stuck alone in rock bottom waiting for the bus. He's just obsessed with getting his free cereal box toy, which is not at all a good reason for him to suddenly become a jerk and yell at his friends. What? What do you want? You missed your surprise birthday party, so I just wanted to bring you a present and some cake. The fact that it happened to be his birthday is one of the most contrived parts of this episode. It feels like this was just added in only to make Spongebob even more upset given how none of the other characters brought it up or even alluded to it, including the birthday boy himself. Now, do I still think this is one of the worst episodes ever? Well, there are still a few funny jokes, such as this one after Spongebob and Patrick's stomachs literally start growling. Oh, I'm gonna take off then. I don't think my arm can stand much more of this. And also the scene where the toy finally arrives and Patrick appears to break it. I waited so long. Spongebob? And you broke it. The way this scene builds up with Patrick looking worried and Spongebob sounding deceptively okay works, although it would have been more effective had the overall story been better written. This plot really didn't need to be limited to Spongebob's front yard. What if Spongebob somehow ended up getting stuck waiting in other places in town and had to hurry home before the mailman arrived? And what if the mail Spongebob was waiting for was a bit more consequential, like a birthday gift for someone? Overall, it's a bad episode, but not one of my least favorites. It gets to be off the list. Next up is Best Day Ever. This episode was in the undesirable position of being an incredibly hyped up, supposedly special episode used to top off a countdown of a hundred fan-voted episodes. Honestly, it doesn't even feel like a special in any way. Last time I called this special bland and curt, which I still feel is the case. It's only 11 minutes long, while all the other specials were at least double-length episodes, and the story isn't all that interesting. Spongebob declares this day the best day ever because he gets to go to work, spar with Sandy, jellyfish with Patrick, and watch Squidward play his clarinet all on the same day. Those are all things he does on a regular basis. The most unusual thing here is that Squidward actually got a gig performing in front of a full auditorium, and even more shockingly, he seemed to put on a good show. And given how the day starts off with the Krusty Krab being condemned, it quickly becomes predictable that something will go wrong with everything on Spongebob's checklist. 
Humor-wise, it suffers from having a lot of jokes that just go by the numbers. To me, the wittiest part of this episode is this gag. Guys, you're ruining the fast day! Mm, fast day. Mm. <laughs> then there is, of course, the Best Day Ever song. This show has had a number of good show tunes, whether they were just silly like the fun song or Hey All You People, or really heartfelt like the songs in Ripped Pants, Texas, and Welcome to the Chum Bucket. But whereas those songs were distinct musically and usually served some purpose in their respective episodes, this one is just a generic pop tune with a repetitive chorus that gets annoying really fast. It's the best. There is one more thing about this episode that bothers me. You see, SpongeBob, it's not about you or your perfect day or any of those things. It's not? No, it's about us. The takeaway here is supposed to be that things don't always go according to plan, so you shouldn't let it totally get you down. But it doesn't work here since, again, pretty much everything SpongeBob wanted to do are things he does all the time anyway. There's practically no real reason why he'd see this particular day as anything special. Best day ever remains one of the worst in my book. Coming in next, we have Krusty Dogs. I'm happy to say that this episode is actually funnier and better written than I remember. It's not perfect, but it sure is a step up from some of the other episodes on this list. The plot of this one is that SpongeBob invents a hot dog made of leftover Krabby Patty meat that becomes a huge hit with customers. So huge, in fact, that Mr. Krabs ends up taking Krabby Patties off the menu. And guess what happens? No, it's understandable for Spongebob to be upset here. He has a job doing something he's both exceptionally good at and passionate about, and all of a sudden it's ripped away from him. On top of that, the Krusty Dog was not only his invention, but he was the one who convinced Mr. Krabs to put it on the menu in the first place. He must feel responsible for potentially dooming his own job. One of the main issues I have with this episode happens about halfway in, just after Spongebob first passes out. You have this rather slow scene of Spongebob being revived by the paramedics, which is followed up by Mr. Krabs recapping the previous scene. You're back in your old kitchen, and the paraparamedics were here to revive you. As it is, this whole segment feels redundant. But while the first half just feels like unnecessary filler, the second half is more relevant to the story. So the overall flow of the episode could be improved by just cutting out the revival scene. In terms of jokes, this episode is stronger humor-wise than my caustic counterpart gave it credit for. There's a variety of jokes that fit well with the characters delivering them. Squidward, can I talk to you for one second? I don't know. That's a pretty long talk. I was asleep. Yeah, but just for a little while. So I only docked your pay for the time you were unconscious. Notably, the characters themselves are written particularly well compared to some of the other post-film episodes. A huge issue a lot of folks had with these later episodes, myself included, was that the characters were becoming less three-dimensional and reduced to having one or two especially exaggerated traits. In this episode's case, Spongebob acts more like the balanced character he once was and doesn't come off as a completely oblivious idiot or a total crybaby. Squidward is the same old grump he's always been, and Mr. Krabs gets blinded by greed but doesn't act like an absolutely heartless monster. I'm striking this one for my personal worst list, without a doubt. Oh, pinch me, Squidward! Pinch yourself, you ninny. At number 17, we have Glove World R.I.P. In this episode, SpongeBob and Patrick discover that Glove World is going to close down and want to spend one last day there. This episode is a sideshow of cheap jokes and an equally cheap plot, and the first sign of its cheapness is how rapidly they thrust us into this unoriginal scenario. That didn't take long, did it? First of all, let's address the story. I fail to see how it's cheap of a story to start off with a bang. The whole idea here is that Glove World has gone from a normal, functioning amusement park to a rundown death trap. Considering that a roller coaster car flew all the way from the park and into SpongeBob's house, it really highlights how dangerous Glove World has become. Plus, I'm not going to be a snob about originality. Nothing is completely original anymore. For the most part, the story is okay. It moves along at a steady pace, and things actually happen. SpongeBob and Patrick's dismay about Glove World's closing is understandable, given that they've known it for so long and so well that they even have reserved seats on one of their favorite rides. Also of note, 
This is another later episode where Spongebob and Patrick aren't excessively stupid or oblivious. At most, their nostalgia blinds them to the park's now dangerous conditions, and even then they later open up and accept it. But, being true to their core characters, they opt to try and fix Glove World rather than give up. Their efforts feel genuine, even if they are undermined by flaws in their character or the park's equipment. The part of the story that feels the most quote-unquote cheap is the ending. The only reason we're closing down Glove World is because Glove Universe is opening tonight! Okay, so a replacement for Glove World had been in the works the whole time, but if that was true, why didn't the park owner just tell them earlier? And how did no one know about the huge new amusement park that was apparently being built across the street from the original? This could have been alleviated by having SpongeBob and Patrick run by a covered up construction site earlier in the episode or something. So, what about the jokes? No, they're not all cheap, but they are very hit or miss. It seems like for every decent joke, there's one that just falls flat. The Ferris wheel has ripped free of its moorings! The, you mean? Uh huh. It somehow ripped free of its moorings! SpongeBob, what are you doing? We must remain seated at all times! We have to jump before this thing crashes, come on! <laughs> But you know I'm allergic to jumping! You know that! Even the fits like a glove joke would have been fine if Spongebob and Patrick had just laughed about it instead of beating it into the ground with a dozen more unnecessary puns. If the quality of the jokes had been more consistent, this episode would have been substantially better. But as it is, it's not that bad either. It's off the list. And now, to love a patty. The idea of Spongebob falling in love with a Krabby Patty might sound like it'd be funny at first, but its execution here didn't leave that impression on me. Essentially, Spongebob makes an especially beautiful looking Krabby Patty that he becomes attached to. To your rosy ketchup cheeks, right down to your mustard smile, may I call you... Patty? Initially, it comes across that Spongebob sees Patty like how an artist looks at their masterpiece. Something precious they'd want to protect and preserve. What are you gonna do with it? Take it home? Put a little dress on it? Go out for a romantic walk with it? What an idea! Right then and there, he instantly starts viewing it as a romantic partner. What happened to the steady pacing seen in the previous episode? After our walk, I'm going for a rowboat ride with Patty. Just waiting for her to put on her makeup. You know, this would be sillier if SpongeBob wasn't taking this, um, relationship so seriously. He even refuses to hang out with his friends in favor of the Krabby Patty. I've been replaced by a sandwich! <laughs> You'd think that SpongeBob's best friends would address this problem more, but they don't show up in this episode again. Instead, at the end of the episode, SpongeBob comes back to reality as abruptly as he fell in love with Patty, for seemingly no reason. When it comes to the humor of the episode, I really don't have much to say. This episode was banking so much on the Spongebob Patty ship being funny that there's few redeemable jokes to speak of. The only joke that fully works was with this random couple. Harold again? Martha, I know what you're thinking. It is not me this time. Regardless, one of the biggest detractors of this episode is its show tune. It eats up a full two minutes of the runtime and only reiterates that Spongebob sees Patty as his girlfriend. Plus, the lyrics are so trite it's not even funny. With you, our love is stronger than glue. There isn't anything, there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do for you. They may as well have cut the song and used the remaining two minutes to develop the story. If you're going to have SpongeBob go a little crazy and fall in love with a burger with a face on it, you could at least give us some insight into what he imagines Patty's personality is like. Without that, it's as though SpongeBob has fallen madly in love with someone solely for their looks. And given how creepy the story comes off as, they may as well have made it a creepy story on purpose. Have Spongebob's madness slowly built up as the burden of keeping Patty safe eats away at his nerves. Give him nightmares, and try sequences of Patty actually talking. It's not like dwelling into the realm of creepy is anything these later seasons were afraid of. How does this one rank with me? I still think it's pretty bad. It lacks decent jokes, the story is unintentionally disturbing, and a good chunk of it is frankly wasted on that show tune. Next in line, we have Funny Pants. In this episode, Squidward becomes fed up with Spongebob's constant laughing and tricks him into thinking it will break his laugh box. Spongebob's laughing does get to be a little much in the beginning, and they seem to have added a squeaky toy sound to it, which makes it extra obnoxious. Ba -la -la, ba -la -la, ba -la -la, ba -la 
While it might give you a headache, it drops off after the first two minutes. It works in terms of the story, too, as poor Squidward can't even sleep a wink because Spongebob just won't stop laughing. I still think that him laughing so much at the saying, another day, another nickel, is, well, stupid. That could easily be fixed by just having him laugh about other things. Speaking of jokes, a lot of the jokes work in this episode, this one being my personal favorite. If you use it too long without giving it a break, you can never laugh again. Is that what happened to you, Squidward? Yes. What? No! And while Spongebob is trying to avoid laughing for a day, he runs into a bunch of rather old-fashioned comedy gags. Old-fashioned, perhaps, but exaggerated to the point where it's funny. Not only does he find the streets covered in whoopee cushions, but a pie truck crashes into the mess and even has a pie instead of an airbag. One fallacy I see in this story is that Spongebob, thinking he broke his laugh box, never thought of seeing a doctor. And despite going to each of his friends for help, none of them thought of that either. My other problem with this story is the ending, in which Squidward breaks his own laugh box, ends up with it surgically removed, and gets a piece of Spongebob's instead. I actually feel bad for Squidward here. True, Squidward's lie did lead to Spongebob losing his laugh, but he confessed in the end. He really didn't deserve this, a fate he'd probably find worse than never being able to laugh again. Despite those story issues, though, this episode is alright, not even close to being one of the worst. Cue the sad music, next up is A Day Without Tears. The story here is similar to Funny Pants, only instead of being sick of Spongebob's laughing, Squidward becomes sick of Spongebob's constant crying. When I said earlier that some episodes had an issue with giving characters overly exaggerated traits, this is what I was talking about. Spongebob's sensitivity has been blown up to the point where it's obnoxious. As such, I wanted him to stop crying as much as Squidward did. The main part of the episode kicks in when Squidward bets Spongebob that he can't go for the rest of the day without shedding a tear. If you cry one tear before midnight, you have to... Wash my bike, clean out my rain gutters, and do all my yard work for a year. Okay, last time, Squidward's goal was to get Spongebob to stop laughing so he can get some peace and quiet. Shouldn't that be his goal this time too? According to this episode, Spongebob cries about absolutely everything, and does so dozens of times a day. Why would you want him on your property for a whole year when you know he's going to burst into tears non-stop? In fact, I promise I won't cry anymore. Oh, nonsense! Spongebob was willing to make an effort to not be such a crybaby. Squidward shot himself in each of his feet with this bet. Sadly, no pun intended, the rest of the episode is a series of repetitive gags in which Squidward tries to get Spongebob to cry. And since it's a Spongebob vs. Squidward kind of post-film episode, it comes as no surprise that Squidward keeps failing and ultimately loses the bet. I'm wondering if it might not be so healthy to hold it on my tears, Squidward. You're exactly right, Spongebob. Let it all out! You know, it's one thing to have an episode meant to say it's okay to cry sometimes and you shouldn't bottle up your emotions, but that message isn't present here. That message isn't just about letting it out, it's about managing your feelings and knowing when and how to express them. By the end, Spongebob is still a complete crybaby with no handle on his emotions. He hasn't learned anything. This definitely feels like one of those episodes that wasn't thought out too well. It's staying on the list. Next up, Slide Whistle Stooges. Here we begin with Spongebob and Patrick annoying Squidward with a slide whistle. This is pretty much all that happens for the first half of the episode. It's a lot of basic movements being accented with the sounds of slide whistles. I agree with Former Me that it wears its welcome out pretty quick. Things don't change up until about five and a half minutes in, when Squidward joins in their game after the dynamic duo compliments his own slide whistling. We get some more of the same jokes with a guy at the bargain mart, then things take a weird turn. Someone help! Baby assaulter! What did him dressing up like a baby and appearing in that carriage have to do with the sound a slide whistle makes? It feels like they forced that in just to give the townspeople a reason to get mad at Squidward. Though, them getting mad for thinking he assaulted a child is a better reason than just wanting to lynch him for playing a slide whistle. Patrick, do you think Squidward is taking this all too far? He brings up a good point. Squidward does get drunk on his own ego and cause a lot more trouble, but if these two had just left him alone earlier instead of driving him nuts, this wouldn't be a problem. The episode ends after Squidward goes over a cliff in a gasoline truck and ends up hospitalized. <laughs> 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 
so while Squidward's slide whistling was disturbing the peace, apparently it doesn't count when SpongeBob and Patrick do the same thing in a hospital, a place where patients are trying to rest and delicate procedures are going on. This episode remains one of my least favorites. When it's not just a boring montage of slide whistle playing, it's just plain mean-spirited with the premise of hurting Squidward for trying to mind his own business. And now, for what I find to be one of the most painful episodes to watch, The Splinter. The premise is simply that Spongebob gets a splinter while at work and wants to get rid of it. On the positive side of things, this episode opens up with some amusing imagery. Unfortunately, that's where this episode peaks. It begins to rush downhill once Spongebob actually gets the splinter. Come on! Uh, oh, that really hurts. Oh, barnacles, this hurts! <laughs> Honestly, I still cringe while watching this. They depict this in such a way that it really does look painful, and it's not the least bit pleasant to watch. Then Squidward comes in to scare Spongebob into hiding the splinter from Mr. Krabs, saying that if Mr. Krabs finds out about it, he'll send Spongebob home. Why are you- I know it's hard to say goodbye. <laughs> we seem to have gone from an episode that was mean-spirited towards Squidward, to one that's mean-spirited towards Spongebob. Aside from these gruesome scenes that are played for laughs, and do so in vain, there's this whole three minute sequence of Squidward freaking out Spongebob and making him cry, for no other reason than his own enjoyment. And it's not just mean, it's totally unnecessary from a story standpoint. The only relevant things Squidward says in this scene are that Mr. Krabs might send Spongebob home, and that he can tell when something is amiss in his restaurant. Other than that, this sequence just wastes time. Afterwards, Spongebob calls Patrick to help him out with the splinter. But instead of helping, Patrick acts like a complete jerk to him. Patrick, this isn't helping! Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were a doctor. Patrick, I'm sorry. I really need your help. Oh, no, no. It looks like you have things under control. Then he gives us another needlessly disgusting and painful scene. Does anyone here recall the episode Suds, way back in Season 1? That was another episode where Patrick plays Doctor and tries to help Spongebob. Only in that case, Patrick's methods were just silly, and if Spongebob said the treatments weren't working, Patrick would just try something else instead of getting uppity about it. Given how cruel this episode has been to Spongebob, it at least grants him the relief of Mr. Krabs pulling the splinter out. Plus, Squidward gets his comeuppance when he fails to obtain workers' compensation by injuring himself. But the few positive points of this episode don't compensate for how ugly and mean a majority of it is. Hands down, this episode stays on my personal worst list. Next up, Squid's Visit. The plot here is that, because Squidward refuses to visit him, Spongebob steals Squidward's vacuum cleaner to get him to come over to his house. My number one issue with this episode is how uncharacteristically off-putting they made Spongebob. He's so out of character that he feels like something out of a bad fan fiction. You won't even recognize the place, Squidward. <sighs> Spongebob is so obsessed with trying to get Squidward into his house, he renovates his own house to be a replica of Squidward's. Even more disturbing, he memorized even the most minute details. He even got the chip and the paint from when I moved in! This makes Spongebob look less like an innocent, well-meaning neighbor and more like a serial killer. You know, these newer episodes introduced a ton of new characters into the series, and this was a lost opportunity to bring in another. This premise could be salvaged if they replaced Spongebob with some crazy new character as the antagonist. On the upside though, it's clear that they were trying to be creepy with this episode, unlike To Love a Patty, and it has at least one good, solid joke. He copied all 492 of my self-portraits! And they're better than mine. As for the episode's ending, Squidward eventually finds his vacuum, but leaves to find his house has burned down. But Squidward doesn't totally get it in the neck here. He gets to sleep soundly in Spongebob's house while the little yellow maniac sleeps outside. Seems like he actually decided to take responsibility for once. This isn't a very good episode, but it's not one of my absolute least favorites. Had they just changed up the story so that Spongebob wasn't the creeper who made a replica of Squidward's house, and added a few more decent jokes, it would have worked much better. And that concludes the first part of the Anime Ball channel premiere. 
Feel free to discuss today's animation in the comments, but please try to keep it civil. It makes the experience better for everyone.